Exhaling Zingaro. Hey, James, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, brother. And thanks for letting me steal some of your footage. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Hey, man. I, I, you know, the nice part is I, I, I don't ever have a problem with people sort of grabbing stuff and all that, like if they want to use it. It's totally fine. As long as they kind of do credit where credit is due, then yeah. I have no issues with that. Because it's all just putting more eyes on it, I figure, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as sailors, as long as you're using it in a good way, if you're talking smack about everybody, uh, that's not, not a good thing. But um, I'm using it for educational content. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Well, and I mean before we get into sort of all the different sort of styles of content that you've been creating over the last bunch of years, like I'm sort of catching you at the tail end of the whole sailing adventure. I mean, is it true? Sort of you're, you're, you're kind of hanging things up, selling the boats and all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to quit sailing. I mean, I've got, I've been sailing for almost my whole life, but um, I'm, I'm scaling right. it back. Scaling it back. I've chosen to focus on my family um, and kind of put the adventure sailing on the side and the voyaging on the side because my, my girlfriend doesn't really like it. She gets seasick. So, um, you know, it's, it's a weird decision for me, and I'm kind of going through an, a little bit of an ex existential crisis now, subconsciously, not really consciously. But, you know, I've, I've defined myself by being a sailor for so long that I think – my subconscious is revolting a little bit. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to go sailing with you. No, I do not want to be on the water. I have no interest in boats right now, but I think I just need a break. This happened to me when I went to music school too. I didn't have any, any interest in music. So it'll come back, man. And I, I, now I can, I can use my time to, uh, Oh yeah. <clears throat> sorry. We have a little bit of a delay. I can use this time to, when my daughter was born, I started this um, course. Like I did all this, market research. I did 50 hours of market research to start a course and I wrote the whole course. And it took me a long time. I probably got like 80 hours into it or something like that. And, uh, I, now I have the time to actually finish it. And I, I haven't decided whether to give it away or to package it and sell it yet. But, um, you know, I think the viewers are going to get a lot of it for free because I'm, I'm going to be putting out content as I make it for the course. But the problem is it's not really conducive to YouTube because it, with a course, you need to kind of condense a lot of information in a, the smallest amount of time so people can get through it. With YouTube, you need to like focus on one small subject and then you know extrapolate on that subject deeply, but only for about 12 to 18 minutes because that's about as, as long as you have. So I've been putting out these really dense videos and they're getting views but this it's not really made for youtube you know so it's it's hard to make both of those work yeah well and the i mean the the information in those about you know what what's the best blue water cruising boat and you know all, all that information is really great i mean i've always been jealous of people that that have this wealth of knowledge of of all these different boats and different attributes the good the bad the pros and cons because i you know, I know a few different boats and I know a West Sail 32 really well, but I've never had that sort of encyclopedic sort of knowledge. Uh, and I don't know, where, where do you think that comes from? Is it just your interest in all torps of vessels or have you just over the years been on so many of them that uh, you've really gotten to know them all? Yeah, I've uh, I've had seven boats and I, I've been around sailing for 25 years and actively cruising for about 10 years and I've just seen and delivered. I was a delivery captain for a while. I still am. Um, and I, I don't know, man, after you have enough miles on boats and you're, you hang out on enough boats and you see enough of them, you're just, you, they kind of have like a, there's not that many really. I mean, everybody thinks there's thousands, but there's only like a handful of, of people that make boats. I'd say under, under a hundred. So, you know, 25 years count to a hundred. How long does that take? Yeah, no, I, I do see your point there. And there are, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a certain number of hull shapes and there's, uh, you know, only a certain amount of different rudder setups, you know, skag hunt or, or like, like the barn door that's on the West sale, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess you could see, I could see how you could gain sort of that, 
that wealth, but to be able to package all of it into those videos and then do the good edits and the cuts and all the imagery and all that sort of stuff. I mean, how, how long does one of those take you uh, to sort of put together? It's got to be a pretty intensive process. That's a good question. Um, well, the new educational series that I'm doing, I started as one video and it ended up being like an hour long. So I was thinking, you know, this isn't going to work. Nobody's going to watch these. That's not the, it's not the right venue. YouTube's not the right venue for something like that. So I, I cut it in half and then I edited it down to like 20 minutes and 30 minutes. So that, that worked. I cut out 10 minutes of, you know, the filler language. And like, if I said something twice, which is a little, you know, it's, it's hard to do YouTube in this direction. I'm still learning like what, what kind of works. But yeah, it took me like two weeks to make like solid 40 hour weeks to make those both those videos. And that's another thing I'm kind of fighting with. Like, do I wow. want to try to make content for YouTube or do I want to try to make content for a course? What would serve the people better? What would serve my family better? And I just don't know what I would really like to do is, is like when I leave, because I'm going to leave the sailing space. I'm done. I, I'm not. I'm not done sailing, but I'm done with sailing YouTube. I think um, it's been a really good run, but I've got other plans and I've got other I've got really cool plans in the future, which I'm not ready to talk about yet. But it, it's going to be fun. I'm staying on YouTube, <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to end up ending, yeah. ending the channel and starting a new channel in a bigger demographic, basically. And um, I well, I'm not sailing anymore either. So it, it, it's a natural end. But um, I, I don't I don't know like what to do with all this information. I mean, like the reason I did this for so long is because of the viewers. Right. And I ended up like like crowdfunding a boat. And the only reason I was able to do this for so long was because of those guys. So I want to go out. And when I go out, I want to give them something awesome, like for free at the end. Like, you know, this is all the stuff I learned in the last 10 years. Here you go. Do with, do with it what you will. But. At the same time, I know people don't really appreciate things that they don't pay for. So I just don't know yet. I'm not sure what to do about it. You have any ideas? Right, right. Well, I, you know, honestly, one of the things that I have gotten into over the last year has been a lot of in-person and then also virtual consulting and coaching. And, you know, the, the virtual stuff is usually an hour to two hour long sessions where I'm talking with clients who are either looking to get boats, already have boats, but are looking for more information, um, and even delving into the ideas of like dealing with the anxiety of solo sailing or making the first pack, uh, passage and planning things, that sort of stuff. And then also, which works for me because I'm you know single and I don't have any family or anything, I can essentially at a moment's notice, fly somewhere, hop on a boat with somebody for three to five days, take them offshore, get them the experience they want. And then, uh, and, and when I get hired on, I'm hired on as a consultant, not a captain. I'm just the guy who, who also happened to go around the world, you know? So I've got that experience to gain and give them sort of the confidence to be able to be like, all right, well, let's, Let's go take our, our Tiana 37 down to Puerto Rico on the offshore route. And, and, you know, without me being there, they wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. And, and they, you know, I think one of the things that makes it work is that through the podcast and through the books and through, you know, I guess a little bit with YouTube, I don't have much of a following there. Um, I've got enough people that, that follow that are sort of like, Oh, okay. This I kind of know this person and I know that when you put a wealth of uh, content out there, you know, people who have been watching you for years, you know, whether you know it or not, they feel like they know you because yeah. You yeah, know, I've seen they've that. seen your face. They've watched you go through yeah. good, bad, everything. I love that. And so yeah. you've, you've already developed sort of this relationship. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. And when you get to meet those people, in person and it is you know caveat it's it's a little bit of a risk when you show up to a boat and you don't you've never met the person you've only talked to them on the phone and made this agreement you know you, you never know what you're getting into but again you know that's part of the adventure as well um oh i've got some stories uh -oh. Did we lose <laughs> yeah. you? probably not for this venue <laughs> shoot 
think we might. Have. I was able to save all that stuff uh, before it cut out. So we pretty much, uh, I was just talking about some of the consulting and coaching that I've been doing. But again, yeah, one of the things, it's tricky because, yeah, I don't have, I, how old is your, your newborn? She's, one. she's like, one? Yeah. She's 14 yeah. months. I mean, you, you measure in months at that age, right? But um, I'm so happy, dude. I like look at the smile. Yeah, I know, right? Congratulations, dude. That's 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 an adventure I have yet to uh, even get near uh, in my life. So that's that's a big one, though, man. Kudos to you on that. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's cool. I I wish that um, everybody has the chance to go through that. Um, and we decided that we're going to, we're going to take her IUD out when I get back. So we're going to have another one. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. Hey, I've got two brothers, so, you know, there's that, that's, it gets chaotic for sure, but boy, you know, in the long run, that's the way to go. I would think. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on their personality. Mine's such an extrovert and she loves kids. And I just think it would be sad to make her a only child. Oh, uh, right. No, no, for sure. For sure. Well, I just takes that for you, man. I, I would call you a pretty big extrovert when it comes from what I've seen. You know, I obviously didn't have time to watch 500 videos. Uh, and I had seen a few in the past uh, before, but I was kind of trying to poke around through some of the I mean, geez, you've been like everywhere on those boats. I mean, can you do like a quick two minute like where exactly you've been on our planet and all the places you've sailed to? I would absolutely love to do that. Let me think about that. So I bought my cruising boat in, <laughs> um, in Florida. I'll just start from when I started cruising because I had been sailing for a long time before that. But um, when I cr started cruising, I, right, I, right. I bought the boat in Florida. I went to Cuba and then Cayman Islands, Jamaica, um, Colombia, Panama, through the canal, and then went down to Easter. Oh, no, I'm sorry, up to... Costa Rica, down to Ecuador. Uh, we skipped Galapagos because we didn't have any money. And um, we did Easter Island, Pitcairn, Gambiers, Tuamotus, the Society Islands. And then we went to the Kiribati, which is like the Line Islands, which is an amazing place. If you have never heard of it, check it out. It's right at the equator. And then I sailed 500 miles back upwind yeah. the, wrong, the wrong way and then turned up north to um, Hawaii. Lost that boat. Um, well, we saved the boat, but it got catastrophic, catastrophically damaged off the coast of Hawaii. Uh, we got it in port, but it was it ended up in the dumpster. It was um, trashed, and um, and then crowdfunded another yeah. boat. Started th I bought that boat in um, Curacao, and I basic and I decided this time I was going to go to Patagonia. I've always wanted to go to Patagonia and see it, so we prepped the boat to go around Cape Horn. Yeah. And, um, in Galapagos, I made the same trip again because I wanted to see Isla del Coco again. Oh, I forgot about that one the first time. Do you know about Isla del Coco, bro? It's like the most beautiful island I've ever seen in my life. Jacques Cousteau said it was the be most beautiful place on the planet for him, too. Um, it's about 400 miles south of Costa Rica. It's a beautiful, cool, it's got a cool history. It was like owned by pirates and whalers for a long time. Anyway, so I went there twice, and then we went yeah, back. Yeah, I've definitely heard of it. Yeah. Um, we went back to Easter Island. Sorry, keep going, keep going. <laughs> my, my, my girlfriend got pregnant. Like, she got pregnant right about the time we were going through the canal after we had prepped the boat for, uh, for uh, Cape Horn. And I was still going to do Cape Horn, and then I was just going to have her, like, do a land-based thing. And I was going to fly one of my girlfriends in to kind of be with her, and then she could meet us as we were going down. But then I just decided at the last minute, like, you know what, I – I want to be there for my kid. I don't want to focus on the sailing thing. I want to really like be there for her growth. So I decided when we were in Easter Island and it was like a last minute thing, it was either take a left or take a right and go to French Polynesia again. Yeah. And so I decided to take a right and um, I ran into these huge storms, man. It was an El Nino year and they were just like the size of Chile. And I couldn't get to Pitcairn again. So we went up and we got to, we, we sailed from Easter Island to Marquesas. And then I wanted to be there for my daughter's birth. So I literally like arrived and then left the next day without even checking in. That was a big process. And then when I arrived to <laughs> Medellin, where my girlfriend was waiting in the mountains at a, at a little um, uh, cottage that I rented, 
she went into labor an hour after I showed up, <clears throat> which was super cool. And the baby was <laughs> ba- baby was born in in the house with a doula while she was straddling me, looking face to face, and all the amniotic fluid went over all over my legs. It was it was intense and amazing, and I'll, experience I'll never forget. <laughs> And I hadn't slept for like three days because wow. it, it was a brutal sail to get there on time. And then, so I went back, re-rigged the boat, well, it's standing rigging, and then sailed the wrong way across the Pacific to get back to, because I decided like, it's probably, probably time I sell the boat. We, we, we had talked about it, like, what do we want to do? What's important to us? And the baby kind of changed everything, which they do. So I sailed back the wrong way, picked up three hitchhikers on the way that had, that had been dismasted which was super cool and fun. I had eight people on a 48 foot boat. Um, and then uh, for 18 days, dude, uh, but they were really cool. And we had, you know, it, it made me, it made us feel good to like, it was a memorable experience. And then went back through the canal again for the third time now, and then sailed it up to Annapolis, lost my engine on the way up there, had to rebuild the engine. Um, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great adventure. Yeah, right. Well, and that that last one was that on that oyster that yeah. I saw the, like the the walk through tour, the one that you're selling. Is that still yeah. for sale right now? Uh, I got I got a couple offers on it. Um, I'm I'm debating whether to take them. The market's really kind of crap right now, so it's it's worth a lot more than I'm going to sell it for. I think, but whatever. You know, it's time to move on. It's t- it's what happens with boats, dude. Yeah, I know. I mean, we had that beautiful bubble back in like 2020, 2021, where you could sell boats for twice what they were worth. And then all of a sudden, I think just, you know, all the people that bought them that really shouldn't have bought them were like, uh oh, what do we do? And there's, they, you know, now the market's sort of flooded with them. And uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just like the housing stuff. I mean, it, it goes up and down, but it's hard to hold on to a boat if, you know, you got to calculate in how much is it going to cost you every single year just to have it and store it and maintain it as opposed to just selling it for a less price. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. And it's not very much. It's like 500 bucks a month for me right now. So that's, you know, when you think about $50,000, that's a a big difference. But um, for me, it's just more about like letting go and moving on. And I'm, I'm in a very big transitional phase again in my life, which I've done a few times, but yeah, I just kind of want to, it's a specialty boat too. It's, it's like a very heavy cruising boat, which with a big keel on it. So it's made to be offshore. It's made to like handle big waves and big seas. And I'm selling it in the Chesapeake Bay where every other boat, it has like a, a five foot draft or a five and a half foot draft. And mine's got a seven and a half foot draft. So it's, it's just, I don't know if that was the best choice to sell it. I probably should have taken it over to the med, but, um, you know, I didn't want it in the hurricane zone. I didn't want it in the Caribbean because you get like 30% less money down there. So it, for me, it was, yeah. it was the right choice at the time. Yeah, no, well, I mean, you know, and you never know. It, all it takes is that one person to get in touch. Who's got all the ticks, all the right boxes. I mean, and it's a beautiful boat. I mean, the, the first, the first transatlantic I ever did was on a 68 foot oyster and those boats are tough and they are comfortable and they're well built. And that one that, you know, through the walkthrough and everything, I, I, that that looks more than key. It's like, perfect. It's ready to go. Yeah. I did a lot of work to it. I changed all the through holes, the plumbing, the water makers new, the batteries are new. All the wiring is new. The, the engines just rebuilt. The transmission was replaced in, in um, Boca Chica, Panama. And on all this work I did myself, you know, so it's, it's kind of one of those things where I don't <laughs> even really want to sell the boat, to tell you the truth. But it's yeah, got, right. Yeah. It's, ti- it's time to change and it's time to, you know, for a new. I have a, I'm sure you're the same way. We have like a novelty seeking personality. So when something gets boring to me, I have to do something else. And, you know, I think the sailing thing has come to an end, at least the offshore sailing for now. I, I still want to go around Cape Horn and I want to go to Antarctica. So in 10 years, I'll probably buy one of those expedition boats that everybody's building for cheap <laughs> and uh, and go around Cape Horn. But yeah, yeah, for right. now, I got a aluminum hall. Exactly. <laughs> 
Well, and I think that's good because, you know, one of the things I think that, that turns into a major uh, roadblock when we're trying to really find happiness and joy in our lives is when we have sort of this coolness factor from what we are doing or it's just something that we've always loved for so long, but it's sometimes really hard to to really have a, a, a reality check where we say like, you know, I don't really want to do this anymore. It's not giving me that that excitement and that enthusiasm and that joy that it always did. And I really should go find something else. Or, you know, one of the big examples that I always saw, because I lived in the Caribbean at, working at a water sports center uh, for like 10 years. And I saw a lot of staff that hung on around that place because it was really cool to be that guy who was in the Caribbean and did this whole thing. And, and every time they rode home to friends, they were in freezing cold like New York or Chicago. And, but they didn't want to be down there anymore. You could tell they weren't happy, but it was impossible for them to let it go because they were so used to being the cool Caribbean guy. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, I, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to really be honest. I mean, I have that times 10, bro. I mean, I'm in sailing magazines and I'm a, I'm a <laughs> pretty bet. famous sailor and I've been all over the world, but for me, for James, it's come to a head and I'm not as happy offshore. I've done, I mean, almost around 80,000 miles. It's plus or minus 2000, which is a shitload of miles. And I, I just, I'm not, I don't really, yeah. really want to be offshore anymore. Plus I, my, my, the love of my life doesn't like it. So, you know, I, I just kind of embraced the family yeah. thing. And I, I think that was the best decision. I'm happier than I've been in years. And you know, my channel is doing better because I'm giving away educational content now. And I don't know, I just, it's time for me to start a new passion project. I think I need to be challenged in another way for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, like I said, I mean, it, good on you for, for being able to sort of, I, I think really it comes down to sort of, I don't know, kind of an ego thing because yeah, I, I, I've definitely felt that same I, I'm not I'm not quite in that same realm of like, oh, I don't want to go back offshore. Like I'm itching to go back offshore. I've finally got some new sales after like three and a half years. And uh, I just can't wait to head out just to get as far from land as possible. But I do know that eventually, you know, hanging up that adventure hat will be like a huge part of it. But one of the, I was on a show. I can't remember how long ago. But the host and I were talking a lot about making that transition from the guy who's out there doing the adventures and having all that fun um, and also going through all the misery that's involved as well. Um, but making that transition to basically trying to get the next generation ready to do the same thing, but also carry with them sort of the skills and the knowledge that you can bring to the table. Yeah, I think there's a big space for that, too. There's a, there's room for a lot of people to do that. You know, the, some people like your personality better. Some people want a smaller boat and want your skills on that smaller boat better. Some people like my te my personality better. And I think there's like if even if we did the exact same thing, there would be enough market share for us both to be very happy and very wealthy in this space. And I do love teaching. I, I don't I'm not the same as you where. I'm, I don't really want to go out on people's boats with them anymore. I, I mean, I would do it if they paid me a shitload of money, but I don't really enjoy being yeah. on someone else's boat for two weeks and teaching them how to use it and stuff. It, that's not the same as being like, I like consulting. I like making videos to teach. I like like explaining things to people. I, I don't, I'm, I think I'm in this space where it's, I told you at the beginning of this thing, I'm going through an existential crisis. I'm just in this space where I just don't want to be at sea anymore. <laughs> it's, it's a really strange thing to say to you. Cause I thought if you would have asked me and people did four years ago or two years ago, you're like, are you ever going to hang this up? I'd be like, hell no. All my kids are going to be on the boat. I'm going to die on the boat. Right. And now I'm in this space where it's exactly opposite, <laughs> but I think I just need a break. Yeah. No, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, nothing it, wrong. It's been with that. 18 the, years. Like 18 I said, years. I mean, the nice part is you can still. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, oh, I've, I've no. been living yeah, on sailboats I mean, I... for 18 years. 
No, 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 no. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm only on year, I guess, year eight. No, year seven of actually owning Sparrow. But she hasn't been in the water in almost two years now uh, after the last voyage. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I Every once in a while, I, I have to definitely confront that idea of, like, okay, well, it's going to be time to sort of move on. And, you know, while my sort of focus – has always been on the the speaking stuff that I do. And that's typically the the sort of breadwinner of all the different little things that I'm I've been going on. That's been a heck of a lot of fun, especially uh this year since, you know, the world has completely kind of come back from from the pandemic days where you couldn't do any of that speaking stuff. And yeah, it's been it's been a, a surprise because I know before all I was trying to do is use that to get back out to sea as fast as possible. And now I'm kind of seeing it as more of like, oh, this is kind of like a little business that I can keep growing and, and grow and grow. And the more energy I put into it, then the more output I get. And wow, OK, this is actually kind of fun. I don't I'm not too worried about getting out there immediately. Let's let's do some more of these talks first and let's see what else we can we can go for. And so it sounds like you're, you're able to, and you've got sort of that outlet for you as well. And it's still right there with that, the it's still with sailing, but it's more on the, on the educational side. Exactly. Yeah. You know, who does that really well? Have you ever met or ran into John Kretschmer? He, he's got a good dichotomy for uh, the educational side and the speaking venues and the, you know, the talks, and then also the sailing. Uh, he's an amazing cat. Yeah, I, I've never met him. He and I have uh, texted back and forth every once in a while. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping one day to sit down with him on the show, but I really want to do that one in person because I kind of have a feeling it's going to be like a five-hour episode. <laughs> like he, he definitely – I've read a couple of his books, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you know, he just um, – I, I know he, he doesn't do much of, like, solo sailing, obviously, but – as far as his heavy weather escapades and the fact that, you know, he's confident enough to just grab a bunch of people, you know, paying customers and head off to cross the Atlantic in the wintertime and go, you know, push through all this bad weather. I mean, my hat's off to him. I don't mind doing that myself, but I know I'm only putting myself at risk and that's a way bigger sort of, uh, amount of responsibility when you got like six people with you and you're, you're going out in February across the North Atlantic ocean. I mean, geez, it's, it's ugly at that time of year. It's awful. It's cold. It's miserable, but he does it well. So I met him and Ryan Renfield right around the same time. And they're both doing that. And Ryan is sail Libra. And I was just in awe and I was kind of um, swooned by the money. Like the, there's big money in that. So I set up my own company to do that and um, used those guys as my mentors, which was super cool and a very good opportunity. And it is, it was so hard, dude. And I, t I talked to Ryan about it and I was like, Ryan, you know, I, I made $30,000 this month and I don't have anything in my bank account. I put it all in the boat. And he's like, yeah, 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 man, we're using a Maserati as a bulldozer. So like you make 200 grand, but you end up with like 30 at the end of the year. <laughs> And it, yeah, he's right. And I, you know, I thought about it long and hard and I'm like, do I want to do this for the next 10 or 15 years with, without making, you're not really making that much money because it, it's really hard on the boat. And I just did make the conscious decision. Like yeah. I, I love sharing this with people. It was a very good way to make money, but this isn't really where my passion lies. So that was a good decision too. And I think like now a 44 year old James is, is getting more introspective and saying, okay, what really makes me happy? Let's take the money off the table for a minute and say, what do I really want? Which is a great way to look at life, man, in my opinion. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's where you really do find more joy than anything is when you do sort of, you got, obviously you have to focus a little bit on the money. There's just no way you can get around it. But if you shelf that for just the beginning discussion of like, what? what direction do I want to go? What areas do I want to investigate? Then all of a sudden, then you can figure out how you can make money once you've pointed yourself in the right direction. But 
And no matter how much money you're going to make, if you're pointed in the wrong direction, you're going to be miserable doing it. I mean, I don't know. I, I've always said that time is our, our most valuable commodity that we waste on a daily basis, or at least some of us do. And we don't have a lot of it. And if you are plugging away, just trying to grasp all this cash, but you're doing something you don't want to be doing, man, that's just, I, for me, it's just a waste. And when you find that thing that you're like, dude, this makes me happy. This is what I would do no matter what. Let's figure out a way to make a little bit of money out of it as well. Then you're on the right path as far as I'm concerned. That's only in my opinion. But, um, yeah, I don't know. So I think, I think your headspace is definitely right. Coming from me, which doesn't mean a whole lot, but I would say you're on the right track. So I'd like to ask you a question. I mean, a lot of your viewers are watching you for you. So I, I feel like we can shift this podcast just for a minute about you for a second, because I don't I don't know that much about you. Sure, I, know you sure. I know you circumnavigated and I, I know you wrote some books. My question to you is uh, when I met John Kretschmer, he said, James, you got to write a book. It will propel your your career in ways you don't even know. So how has your writing career uh, affected your life and and is it something that you make um, m like a lot of money with or is it more like the speaking gigs came from that or I'm interested in like should I write a book basically is what I'm asking you yeah it's well it's kind of interesting so when I when I finished that trip I didn't really have any intention in doing that but then I was urged to do so pretty rapidly and I figured, you know, okay, well, let's give it a shot. I had zero money. I basically blew everything on that trip and the boat and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, one of the, believe it or not, one of the biggest reasons that I was sort of agreeing to this was that I figured it was the perfect excuse to go and sail down to the Caribbean for the winter and be down there and write the book, but then also have all the fun I want to have. Um, which is what I wanted to do anyway. So I go down there, I write the book, I come back, and obviously I still don't have any money, so I had to publish it myself on Amazon. But that turned out to actually be pretty uh, beneficial, I think. Um, all the publishing companies wanted to change everything about the book as much as possible because obviously they're trying to – they're just seeing dollar signs. And I really – I don't know. I was so inspired by Knox Johnson and Bernard Motissier and all that sort of stuff when I wrote that. You know, Motissier wouldn't even let anybody look at the thing until they, they just had to agree to publish it. He was like fully like, this is my poem, you know, and he would just wanted to put it out perfect. I wasn't quite that far, but regardless, uh, put that thing out. And then, you know, it allowed me when I look back on it through especially the dark days of like COVID and stuff, the only reason I didn't have to sell my boat was because that book, the, the revenue that was coming in every single month uh, allowed me to pay for the dock space, keep up the stuff. And it wasn't a huge amount by any means, but it was enough to sort of keep it going. And then, you, you know, you add the audio book in. And then, you know, I just wrote these children's editions for it and all that sort of stuff. So you can kind of you can make a bunch of little revenue streams that that because we have voices that reach, you know, thousands of people, um, you can kind of expect to initially sell quite a few of them. And if it's a really good book, then all of a sudden, yeah, then I don't know, it might get picked up by a publishing company or you would just see the sales out there because you can promote it yourself um, it also, I think really does help when, when, you know, people are trying to figure out when corporate, corporate conferences are sitting around and they've got 10 or 12 people on their list and they're trying to figure out who's going to be their lineup for their keynote speaker, you know, having, having just that little term, that little title up there, that says author, uh, I think helps quite a bit for those. Um, and then obviously, a lot of those things, when, when I book them, they'll buy like 200 copies of the thing, or I will go and bring 100 copies with me, and then we sign them and sell them. And, and so it's another sort of way to generate a decent amount of revenue. Now, I, I definitely am nowhere near uh, the, the old crutch when it comes to writing, not only in how good it is, because I'm not a great writer, but also how many books I have. I got the basically the one book in a bunch of different formats. And then I've got the children's book and stuff. But 
Um, I have yet life, life keeps getting in the way, uh, for me to finish off any of these other books that I've been trying to write about, like the doldrums and then some of the other mishap voyages that I've been on. Um, cause I really think you need, you need to be able to have like three or four hours every single day until you start. And then until you finish that book. And I was able to do that back then, but I haven't been able to find that that sort of peace and quiet since. Um, but yeah, to answer your question in the longest way possible, I think it's absolutely worth it. Um, I think it, it, it gives a little bit of validity to everything. Plus, I don't know, in my head back in the day, I, when I started doing yacht deliveries, you know, every boat had a library of books on it. Most of them didn't have any sort of screens or computers or anything like that. And I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just nostalgic for those days where, you know, when you crossed an ocean, you had books, you didn't have screens and you didn't have Netflix off, a uh, off of a uh, satellite or anything like that. Right. And I don't know, to me, having a sailing book, especially one that's in like a very niche sort of thing, as far as sailing, uh, doing a solo nonstop around the world. It's cool that my book, people will send pictures of their little library on their, on their boat. Uh, and it's got Knox Johnson and Matissier and Chichester and sailing into oblivion. And I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, that makes so me feel sick, good. Man. And to know that it inspires people. Yeah, it does. That's... It feels really good. Like it's, it's got some benefits for sure, but it's not easy. I mean, it took me a year to, to finish the book. Uh, and then it took, I don't know how many months of trying to get it to a publisher before I finally gave up on that. And then it took me probably another six months before I finally found somebody to edit all the mistakes and all the, the grammar and stuff finally out of it. And it was just somebody who read the book that really loved it. And they were like, dude, you gotta let me edit this thing for you. <laughs> and it's funny. I've, I'm looking at a shelf over here and I have about 20 copies of the first edition that like, I literally spelled things wrong on the back cover and I have those and I have a little square of, um, the original jib sale or staysail sale that's going in it. Just like, it's kind of a throwback to, um, Slocum, because on his first edition, he cut up pieces of the sprays mainsail and put them in there and signed them. And so I've got those. Those are going to be like, if I ever try and do some big campaign or something, I'll try and auction those things off. as like the first edition with all the mistakes. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you do that, I recommend Kickstarter. Kickstarter would be the only venue that you'd be able to do that really well with, and it would, it would go off. So if, just keep that oh, in the back okay, of your mind. Okay. If you ever... If you ever need some advice with that, I'd, I'd be happy to help you. Yeah. Oh man. I honestly, like I, I could pick your brain for hours about just like some of the YouTube stuff. Cause I, there's like a wealth of, and, and, and that's just on the technical sort of financial side. I, I really like all those trips that you described to me in just those couple of minutes, those are all documented on your channel. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Except for well, I, actually, like, now I it's crazy because. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you again. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I actually, uh, we were like a year ahead with the videos, and the trip that we took, um, I did some really cool stuff that I didn't document. Well, I documented it, but me and my girlfriend broke up, and as I was like using that footage it was really sad to me so at a certain point i had to say look i'm gonna cut this off because she's been gone for six months and i'm still doing videos about us together and it's too hard for my heart so some of it didn't uh, get like the like like the very end with the cat didn't get um didn't get documented which was some of the coolest stuff but uh yeah most of it most of everything else did wow okay okay because now i mean you know a, a lot of the sort of sailing genre, uh, especially for those those who started, you know, five, six, seven years ago, it's it's such a huge volume. It's kind of almost like you don't know where to start. Um, and you also it's hard to get a full recap, I guess, of like 
how how epic and and all the different places you've gone but now knowing that that is like yeah that's that's gonna be my little side channel that i get to sort of i don't know live vicariously through it but also that's really cool do you you. know i I mean it's it it's it's neat to be able to sort of meet the person and then go back in and and kind of be more relatable in a way and then also I, you know, one day I'd like to sail to a lot of these places. I mean, I, I really enjoy doing the nonstop stuff, but the game plan has always been, you know, once I hit my fifties to make a lap around the planet, stopping everywhere and take uh, a bunch of years to do it. Um, and also do it with other people. And I think, I think channels like yours are, are really, really helpful. I mean, it's like a live cruising guide that you get the ins and outs of everything. It's absolutely amazing. The problem is I can't really put like as much information as I want for the cruisers because I'm making this stuff for people that are watching, not the sailors. You know what I mean? So YouTube has been a very interesting yeah. venue for me. It's not like this is the best way. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm uh, it, it, like you're making videos for a, a particular audience and that's what's paying you money. And the audience isn't necessarily where yeah. uh, your passion lies in video production. So what works on YouTube may work differently on a, a different um, venue. But, you know, YouTube off the table, just as sailors from sailor to sailor, I think it's awesome that there's so many different kinds of sailors. There's the voyagers. There's the crazy nonstop sailors like you. There's the um, coastal cruisers. There's the snowbirds. There's the... You know, the guys that are just dipping their feet into it. There's the guys that have been doing it for like 80 years. And I it, I just, it's, it's amazing how everybody can find like a little niche that they love. And there's no judgment and we all help each other. And that's what really got me into sailing. Before YouTube, when I first started, I had bought this boat and just to try it out because I had a buddy in the Navy that died sailing. And he was my best friend. His name was Rob Mudd. Rob, love Oof. you, buddy. And uh, he was sailing around Hawaii. A big Kuna storm came up there. If you know anything about Hawaii, they have really bad storms that pop up out of nowhere. And uh, he lost his rudder. Boat went on the rocks. He got into his life raft, but the but the waves were so big that he was popping off flares, and they couldn't get out to him. And he ended up getting in the waves and dying and drowning. So it was his idea to sail around the world. I didn't even like sailing. I was I thought it was too slow and boring. I, I was a, I was a wakeboarder at that time. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. And so I bought a boat and I, um, had this boat for like, you know, a couple, couple months. I paid a guy 40 bucks to take me out sailing and all he did was smoke cigarettes and drink beer. And I was like, well, if this guy can do it. I, I'm going to do it. And I just kind of taught myself. And then I, uh, I, one day there was, I came back to the boat and all of the mooring lines were new. And I was like, I was asking people at the dock, like, what happened? Oh, there was a big storm. And uh, your boat broke loose because the mooring lines were super old. And the German couple down the dock, they came and they they hooked you up. And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I got to go give them some money or something for the ropes. So I went down there with like 50 bucks and I I went to give it to them. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You'll learn. (laughs) We are not. We have so many ropes, man. We're we're (laughs) not going to take your money. And like from that point, I moved on to my boat. And like these are my people now. And it was fucking amazing sorry for my french but i've just had the coolest life because of all the people i've been able to meet which is really hard for me to stop going full circle like doing part of my existential crisis is i don't want to leave this group of people they're my people so it's it's interesting to kind of like try to get out of it but keep my toes in it and maybe do some consulting work but still can talk to people like you and i mean i love meeting amazing sailors that are totally into something that i'm not you know? Yeah. 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 Well, I, and that's one of the, the realms where, so I, I do kind of three different tiers of speaking where one of them is schools, whether it's grade schools or it's colleges, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I normally don't do high schools cause those, th- that age group is, uh, pretty tough to, uh, keep the attention uh, of, but grade schools and, and colleges, but then, Obviously, corporate things pay for sort of the whole thing, obviously, but it's the yacht clubs and and the sailing clubs and sailing schools that you get to really 
connect with on on such a personal level because they're all there doing the same thing that you love doing and then you get to stick around afterwards and hear all their stories and you make all those connections i mean i i i'm speaking at a school uh in virginia in a couple of weeks and the husband of the uh the woman who who contacted me he's like dude when you're out here you gotta stay on my boat like We'll go out to eat. It's a great sense me pictures of it and everything. And cause he knows, you know, I got to stay in a hotel if I don't stay there. And, and so you get to make all these great connections with people. And, you know, all I have to do is be willing to get up there on stage for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and have a pretty compelling story. Um, and I, I thankfully, I, I would never, if, if it was something that was miserable, I don't think I would ever do this, but I've, I don't know. I've always enjoyed getting up on stage and I, I feel pretty comfortable doing it. So um, I'm lucky in that event, but it is, it's, it's great to just still meet people. And I would think with the sailing resume that you've got, Holy cow. People would love to hear you could, you could cherry pick so many different stories and adventures and uh, put something pretty, pretty darn cool together. I, I have no doubt. It would be a different kind of, thing for me that actually that would be challenging and actually i'd be very interested in that but i i think yeah that's why i'm that's why i asked you about writing a book i think that would get you in the door for those kind of different venues and different kind of ways to reach people at a more direct level yeah and very interesting thanks for that answering that question man i appreciate that yeah yeah no worries no worries well well hey listen i i hate to say it but um, I have to get in a car and drive down to Chicago because I have a client. Shout out to Joseph, who I'm going to join uh, for a couple of days sailing and then haul his boat out. Um, but I have to hit the road. And I, but I, I do want to ask before, before we cut this off, dude, we, we got to do another one of these like in the next couple of weeks. I feel like we just got started chatting. Absolutely. I'm 100%. Is that possible? In. Absolutely. I'm in, bro. Nice to meet you. Is, is uh, we're kindred spirits, my okay. friend. Okay. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, and I, I kind of almost want to have a chance to to do a little bit more deep dive on some of the videos, so I can have maybe a few more poignant questions uh, as far as some of the adventures. Because obviously, I really want to hear about going through the Panama Canal. And if you've been through three times, you definitely have the ins and outs of that and stuff. But. Um, but with, with the last few minutes, is there anything that you want to plug? Obviously, I'll put stuff and links in the description of the episode. But is there anything that you want to share out right now? Uh, not really. Maybe maybe if you guys are looking for some educational content and you're getting into boating, I'm about to share everything I've learned in the last 10 years of cruising and 80,000 miles. So I don't know if that's going to be behind the paywall or not, but... Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, Sailing Zingaro, uh, most of it will be out there, and at least you'll be able to find that information. So, yeah, maybe just that. And thank you for having me on the podcast. Okay, fantastic. Dude, no, thank you. This was this was great. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I, on that same note as, as a lot of the stuff we've talked about, this podcast has been, you know, it's not huge by any means. But I've, you know, I'm cre creeping in on episode 300. Wow. I have met and had the chance to sit down with other sailors, you know, for like an hour, sometimes two hours. And, and sometimes it's in person. Sometimes it's, you know, online like this. And it's an amazing, amazing experience to just be able to get to know people, make those connections and sort of hear all these stories. So maybe that's another one you ought know, to throw in the old sleep. It's hard. It's hard to keep going with it week after week after week, but uh, it's definitely been very fulfilling for me. Cool, man. Thanks. Appreciate that. I'll take that into consideration. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, no worries. If there's anything I can ever do for you, you let me know. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Much love, my friend.